Hey, what's up, me gente? It's your girl Tori Indeed, and today I had the opportunity to interview artist Mark Dennis, super talented and amazing soul. I definitely did not need a cup of coffee to wake up my human mind. So if you missed the live and on-demand interview, here's the snippet. Okay, so what is your primary genre of art? So I, 99% of the time I do uh, oil painting on canvas or linen. Sometimes I do watercolors, but it, I'm a painter, primarily a painter. And with that, of course, comes the fact that I do a lot of drawings and hundreds and hundreds of sketches a week. I know. I absolutely love, love, love. I'm just going to throw it up there right now. Um, in the background, we have your website, but this is actually one of your masterpieces, a mixture of messages and things from your day-to-day -day life. So did you want to break down anything particular in this artwork? Yeah, yeah, but I, I'd like to actually. Um, so yeah. during the time of the pandemic or the so-called lockdown, and we were on our phones and our right. screen, you know, iPads and whatnot, we were, we were basically living like a screen life. And during that time, we all were sending and receiving thousands and thousands of messages. Some were personal, some were public, some were about the pandemic. Some right. So nonetheless, during that period, I began to do a series of paintings based on these messages. And then I was watching Mindhunters as well on Netflix. And I started to realize that the FBI investigation board thing was really intriguing. That you can make all these weird and wonderful and magical uh, connections between things. So I took messages that were sent to me via Instagram or my phone, you know, through a, a simple text. Right. And to put them on post-its. And then I realized that if I put the post-its in paintings, then it would look like a Trump Lloyd, like I could fool the eye that people were looking at. They wouldn't know what they would be looking at if they saw my paintings on a screen. So the right. evolution of this is kind of, you know, it kind of came out with the idea of love in the time of Corona with right. personal private messages. And then of course, naturally it, it, in the paintings, you'll see my studio wall spattered with paint you'll see masking tape. And there are things here that have a personal relationship as well as a very public hype. Right. Relationship. So I and see then, the pandemic. Yeah. The banana. An artist, a rather famous artist named Maurizio Catalan. Uh, he's sort of like a satirist. He's a very funny guy. Uh, he taped the banana to the wall uh, during Art Basel uh, and it sold. It was meant, you know, I never, I will never know the actual intentions, but nonetheless, <laughs> it sold, I believe for a quarter of a million dollars, I think, if no I remember. Way. Yeah, 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 $250,000. Somebody thought it was art. So I always thought that there was something very ludicrous, ridiculous, kind of genius, almost right, evil right, about, right. about that. And, you know, it's sort of a mockery on our art world and I wanted to play with that so I painted the banana exactly the way it looked being a hyper realist right. as though we're on the wall and you know from there things spiral out I mean my works are kind of like uh little mini tornadoes you know things spin or spin around and there's always oh, a sense yeah. of focus absolutely so I, I guess that goes along with you know your journey you know in life itself you have art within your art because I, I yeah. recognized a piece of one of your artworks, which I'm going to bring it up and I don't want to mistitle it. Yeah. So I do that a lot. I, this, I will paint. Yeah. From a close distance. So the painting in the center of that is by an artist named Ang or Angre. I guess that would depend on the French dialect, but the painting in the center is at the, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's one of my favorite paintings in the world. And I thought if I could paint that, repaint it, so to speak, right. as though it appears on my studio wall, surrounded by the process by which I work. So I work from photographs. So I work from studies, both small and large sketches as well. So that is a painting of a painting as though it would appear on my studio wall. Everything in this thing you're looking at is paint, wow. including the wall, the marks on the wall. That's push so paint. brilliant. I love it. Yeah, well, that. thanks. Wow, I should talk to you every morning. So, <laughs> yeah, so this painting, the idea of it naturally is during the pandemic, how we were so far away from things. But at the same time, 
we were staring at things on our screens. So this right. is about this is about falling in love with the painting all over again because I couldn't go to the museum to see it. And it's one of my favorite paintings in the world. On a previous interview that you did, and you mentioned that when you were younger, you loved animals and you would paint, uh, draw uh, chipmunks and squirrels. And that was that like your go-to when you first started getting into art? Because you yourself, to me, your art. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, I, um, so, we all have very complex and very layered histories, but I'll try to be as brief as possible because I'm one of those guys that could also talk for hours and hours about one. <laughs> but yes, animals were my go-to. In fact, I spent a lot of time in the woods as a kid. I grew up in a family of five boys. My mother always said, get out of the house. I don't want you in the house. We were always too right. loud, beating on each other and having, we were just loud and rowdy. So she sent us in the woods and I, to the woods. I would go outside and we would play football and all, but I would step into the woods and I would go disappear and I'd be turning over rocks and breaking off branches, looking for little creatures and animals became to me, because you know, we as humans are animals, we just are, I just wanted to know more about the other animals. And right, right. to become a painter, it was odd. I, I asked my mom and dad one day, you know, I think I was 10, I said, could you, could I have art lessons? You know, I was really intrigued. I drew, I drew as a kid, but you know, no one really, I mean, no one really told me that there was a life as an artist. I mean, as a kid, who knows? I mean, most kids draw anyway. So at right. 10, at 10, my mother took me to get private lessons at uh, a woman's house, I believe in the town in which we lived. I don't know, it was right outside of Boston. I don't remember it exactly, but uh, I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know, I, I didn't, it was like that old comment, you don't compare for you may despair, but there were other kids in that class <laughs> that I thought were better than me and I didn't like it. I I felt a little like mm, intimidated. So I went upstairs to talk to the woman's husband. They were an older couple and it turns out he was a taxidermist and he had tons of taxidermied animals all throughout the house. And oh, wow. he, he said to me, would you like to draw or paint one of these things? Would that inspire you? Because I told him I loved animals. So he let me take a chipmunk a taxidermy chipmunk home oh, and I, wow. yeah, took, I, and I painted that thing all night long. It was in watercolor. But at that point I discovered that I really wanted to be, uh, I wanted to paint and draw animals, but I didn't think being an artist, you right, know, like, right. In, like in high school, the guidance counselors and all the other kids are talking about going to college and they're talking about being whatever lawyers and whatever. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. But right. uh, when I got arrested, I had to figure it out very quickly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was what, at the age of 15? 15 and a half, I was arrested Ooh, wow. for some pretty serious stuff. So in court, <laughs> I had to explain to a jury of my parents, peers, and some local town people, I guess, to council people, right. what I was going to do with my life. Like, could I go straight? You know, could I figure it out? Could I fix my, my wow. issue of being, a, I guess, today would be called a thug, but you know, I really wasn't. I was a good kid. I just, I did pretty good in school. Hell, I was on the yearbook committee, but oh, wow. I got into trouble, <laughs> you know, after uh, dark hours, I got into trouble, hence my name now, Dark Menace, but. I love that. Yeah, yeah you thanks. get into the name, Dark Menace. That's your Instagram, <laughs> which um, we've been throwing up there as well. Yeah, um, tell me a little bit about the Dark Menace. It kind of matches you. <laughs> yeah, I'm told that. So. <laughs> My, I taught college for uh, 14 years and my students, I guess, you know, as students often do, they just don't stop thinking about weird things. And one day, one of them said, you know, you should have a nickname, Dark Menace. This was before Instagram. Right, right. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I've never thought of that. All my life, I never thought about being referred to as the dark menace. I never thought about flipping my initials. <laughs> I was always the doctor because MD. Right. Like I was told by a girl I started to date in high school. She said, you know how we referred to you at lunchtime? We always called you the doctor because you're my initials MD. So yeah. I always had that going on for me. But, <laughs> you, but you then I thought dark menace. As so, well. You could definitely have Right, because I and I wear a lot of black and I'm always kind of, I have these weird dark vibes sometimes. So in your artwork. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. So anyway, I took the I adopted a dark menace and I am now the dark menace. 
That is absolutely amazing. That's a super cool story for sure. I feel art saved your life. That's what I feel that. Uh, 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 yeah, I feel, I feel like very blessed to be honest with you that people actually like what I do. I, I, I mean, it's that simple. Right. I, think, I think the greatest motivation for an artist is to be appreciated. Wow. And I was always appreciated. In high school, I used to make, you know, sometimes 300 bucks a week. I never dealt yeah. drugs. I never had to do all that. I would draw, <laughs> thing, I would draw things for people and they would pay me. You'll like, deal art. <laughs> yeah, I was dealing art. I was the art dealer. What are some things that you would suggest or give advice to someone that has a bright talent like you once, like how you began? Yeah. So um, everybody has a different journey. Everybody has different needs and clearly, certainly different desires. And, right. and everyone's path should be individuated to the extent that whatever and however they're informed, they can make the best decisions. I didn't want to be an artist. In high school, I knew I was talented, or at least I had some skill I could draw. People appreciated me. I made some money. You know, but I never really knew art was a career. Like, I mean, knowing what I know today, it's very difficult. It's very challenging. And you have to really be up for the challenges and the many, many hours in isolation. It's funny, we all talk about the pandemic and the lockdown and how people were freaking out being home alone. Right. Well, I'm, I'm alone most of my time anyway, unless I'm hanging with my kids, you know? So it's either I'm in the studio or I'm with my kids. And I mean, if so when people are, are contemplating careers, and I don't think college is for everyone, that's for sure. I think that's a given nowadays, but it all depends on your source of support, like you say, right. support is really important. My parents didn't necessarily support me to be an artist. They just never told me not to draw. Oh, okay. Like right. they never just, but you know, they listened to us. What they really wanted most of their five sons was to get out of the house. So. Right. And stay out of trouble. <laughs> I, yeah, stay out of trouble. I mean, like every, nobody wants their kids getting in trouble, you know, and sometimes right. kids think they're going to be athletes. And that's another chat. I mean, there's so many obstacles and hurdles in life. And nowadays in particular, because we're all so engaged in so many different things online, I think right. the opportunities that are going to be available for kids or for high school students or for college students in, say, just four, five, ten years is going to be jobs that we've never even heard of. So uh, that's right. It's really hard to be also self-motivated. And I was extremely self-motivated as a kid. Uh, you know, I'm a team player, you know, I played sports growing up too, you know, and whatnot, but I, you know, being an artist, you have to really, really, you have to really love yourself first right. and foremost. And you want to be, you know, to be alone with yourself and your ideas. And uh, it's not easy, but nowadays as well too, you know, the art world is so, so big, so many artists. I don't really know uh, the best advice to give to anyone. I can tell you this though, when I was a professor, college professor, I had parents come up to me every now and then and, and, and ask me the simplest question in the world, which every parent is going to want to ask, and then they're going to want an answer. And they always ask me, what is the key to success for my kid to become an artist? Right. And I would always say, and I think this applies to any profession, any industry, I said, there is no key to success. That's a fact. However, there is a key to failure. Ooh. And the key to failure is trying to please everyone all the time. Wow. So I That's usually... deep. I'm going to use that and I'm going to requote you. Don't <laughs> worry, I'll put your name on it. Um, all right. Wow. I, you know, I hear a lot of motivational quotes and sayings. Oh, the key to success is never giving up. The key to success is this and that. But truthfully, the only key to anything is failure. When you self-doubt, when you don't pursue it, when you don't do it. Yeah. I think self-doubt is a human trait. Why shy away from the things that make us vulnerable? Because if we don't recognize our vulnerability, we're, we're not going to learn how to, how to get stronger. There's a lot of bullshit out there about right. being successful. I don't, I've never been any of that. I don't, you know, of course you stay with something if you love it enough. You yeah. commit to something like anything, a relationship, your art, 
you know, if you're writing a memoir, if you're trying to compete in the Olympics, you stay with it because you love it. You believe in it. You, you always push yourself, but, and you know, there's nothing wrong in waking up one morning and thinking that you're not that good. It's okay. It's okay to feel weak. Wow. That is amazing. And very well worded. Um, this conversation could take hours. I'm sure I could pick your brain all day, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> I will not do that to you. But um, so, uh, of course, you've had a journey. You've overcome obstacles. You beat the odds, really. And um, I, again, art saved you. I That's just me. Um, I believe in karma. I believe in um you know putting the good out there and like you said you're a team player you um are you're adaptable so whether you're playing on a sports team or into your artwork you're able to be adaptable you know as a young um, artist so now fast forward to who you are today is that still something that you're um capable of doing i feel um that you know as a professor or as an artist that you're still adaptable you know you're around students then you go yeah you're in your art studio by yourself so is that pretty much the same thing now today yeah yep i'm i so you know i have two kids a daughter she's 12 and a half going on what appears to be 17 oh, and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. The love is through the roof for both of these kids, well, to the moon and back or around Jupiter and back, wherever, you know. The, but, uh, and my son is 10 and a half, and they feed me a lot of uh, challenges, but they feed me a lot of uh, motivation and inspiration that I never suspected. So today, fast forward, as you say, today, first and foremost, I'm a father, and uh with that comes a newer kind of strength and insight into making art. I have learned, and I will say that this has a lot to do with the last two, three, four years uh, where I believe that it's time for me to circle back to my sense of humor and bring that a little bit more, uh, more exposed in my work. So, you know, I make my kids laugh all day long. They make me laugh and I think what I need to do with my work is create more smiles and my viewers. So, and, and, you know, that's, it's also giving thanks in a way. And I appreciate what you're saying too. I've overcome a lot. Right. I mean, we all, we all, you know, we all have our strikes and our, our battles and struggles. Oh, absolutely. And, but, oh. um, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to continue to feed it. And I do teach, I do keep in touch with my former college students. And um, I don't know, I want to give back to the world. You know, I want my legacy to be the way I made people feel, not necessarily what I said to them. Wow. So how do you feel that, or how can you describe that your artwork evolved from, you know, now that you want to put smile, you know, smiles on faces and um, you want them to feel something particular like has your artwork um evolved from dark to nice beautiful flowers i, I love the flowers that you paint yeah They're beautiful beautiful I'm, so <laughs> my I mean, it's funny the flowers <laughs> the flowers emerge from darkness all I of my saw... all of my bouquets are based on the memento mori theme which is uh you know in latin it simply means we too shall die and my flowers are riffs on the old master bouquets. Well, I saw I the was... sunflowers. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's okay. It's, we, we, you know, it happens with Zooms and stuff. Yeah, I saw the sunflowers. And I'm going to actually bring it back up. And I love sunflowers. Um, they, they have so much meaning. Although the flowers are, the sunflowers are dying it's still so beautiful then you have these flowers yeah so all the so what you're looking at now these are all part of my big painting and all the little right. things that you see yeah these are all studies for larger paintings and the sunflowers are, are a riff on vincent van gogh who was oddly a very big inspiration for me uh when i was younger i mean i think most people turn to van gogh for a lot of reasons you know he was really misunderstood. 
sadly he had a rather severe mental illness but you know it's all coming to light in more recent times but the sunflowers to me were all like a bunch of little sunsets mm. maybe maybe stars colliding but they are dying so these are all up this is all about how beauty shall fade right wow that was well captured i love that it's just so amazing because when i see the the whole piece right like you said it's like a the fbi's investigation you know i feel like i can relate to this you have your art within your art and it's just it's madness and i can relate to that because um you know i didn't say it yet but as a creator i claim insanity you know nobody knows like what goes on in my mind as a creator when i come up with an idea it's just this is how my brain looks like you're bored yeah so yeah. I, I have often said <laughs> when i taught and the students would ask me i need some inspiration what what, what you know they always ask what should i paint what 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 should i draw like how do i go about this and you know it's based on assignments and whatnot and i will always say you know just have fun you know you are who you are and look inside and try to make it a little bit personal but for the most part just have fun and just see what happens and a lot of making art and a lot of my life and i think many people's lives especially today is about exploring and experimenting I mean, nothing for me is concrete except maybe taxes and death. Like that's the old adage, you know, like I don't, I mean, the strongest power, the strongest force that humans can experience is easily love. And if you love what you do or you love the, the moment you're living life, life's going to be okay. Wow. That was so nicely worded. And it, it, it just brings ease to me as a fellow creator. You know, I, I create my own madness and other and other outlets and, and things. But I know that that's definitely um, relatable to me. And I thank you for that because, you know, it's tough. It's tough to understand one's mind in general. And then now if you're an artist or a creator, it's just like, oh, you're not going to get it. <laughs> Unless yeah. you fin see my finished art. The Modern Master. And that was an editorial decision i sir i'm humbled believe me i'm humbled and i was featured in it and uh the publisher who evidently is a fan uh in the best sense of the word called called me a modern master realism i know that it's just so impressive the shadows and it's like my dog just jumped in front of my painting in a room <laughs> yeah you know when i was a kid and when i was in high school Oddly, I never went to a museum when I was in high school, but my first year uh, of college or um, look, I almost have the same outfit on in that picture. That's kind oh. of fun. <laughs> yeah, that's my thing, either Puma or Nike. So it works for you. I love I'm like it. a I'm like a tracksuit guy. And so <laughs> um, when I went to my first museum exhibition, I saw a painting that was a, a Trump lawyer painting and Trump lawyer is the French term for uh, to trick the eye or seduce the eye or to fool the eye. Ooh. And I would stare at these paintings thinking, my God, they look, you know, like, where's the shadow coming from? It, I really, you re they're very tactile. They're very believable. And I always wanted to do that as a painter. So I never really strayed from being pretty representational as, or hyper realist painter, as some people refer to it. And the idea is that I always wanted to make it look, um, like I was also fooling the viewer's eye, I, that they were unsure of what they were looking at. So when I created that dog- Or something, yeah. or- Yeah, yeah, so, so the shadows really matter. You had mentioned about the shadow of the dog in the Frisbee. And it, it's very important, I mean, you know, it's very important. I have to do a lot of uh, the experiments, you know, with shadows in my studio wall to see how dark they should be painted or how blurry the edges are, depending on how close the object is. Wow. Do you have a dog? Is that your actual dog? No, we don't, <laughs> no, we have no pets. Two, okay. two, two gerbils. And, okay. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, I do know that you are represented by a gallery, um, which is amazing. And that you do exhibit, you know, solo as well. So that yeah. is 
uh, to me, considered accomplishments. Are those some of your um, greatest accomplishments alongside like your artwork? I, I have never thought, I know people are not gonna believe this and I, I've never thought about my accomplishments. I live day to day. I know I work really hard. I love hard, I play hard. I've never really made a list of what, what my accomplishments. I mean, I have goals and objectives. Right. I don't have a list, however, that I cross off when I achieve one. I, I just keep going. You know, I'm like, uh, I, I mean, I'm like a robo painter, you know, like I'm just in a good way. I don't remember RoboCop. If he was bad or good, I don't remember. Exactly, <laughs> but, but, you know, I just do what I do. And I, I think every moment I, okay. I said recently, I said recently to someone that if I, you know, put both feet swing off the edge of the bed and hit the floor, it's an accomplishment. You are so relatable in so many different ways. So, you know, the typical question, where do you see yourself in five years? I yeah. don't like that question because like you said, you live day to day and yes, you have goals, but once you reach that goal, you might come up with something totally different or something brand new that has Absolutely. nothing to do with yeah. that five-year plan. I don't like that question. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll just add to this because I agree with you completely. And you too are relatable and thank you for that. But when I was in court and the judge leaned over, sort of like a twisted sister video, and she said to me, Mr. Dennis, where do you see yourself down the road? Do you see yourself attending college? Do you see yourself, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? And I said, you know, Your Honor, every day is a lifetime. Whoa. I don't know where the hell it came from, but that was it. It ended that conversation. Is that when you were 15 and a half, right? 15 and a half. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yes. Because, yeah, I just, I just don't get those questions. I just don't understand that because me as a creator asking you, hey, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm still doing the same thing that I'm doing today. I've been doing this since I was a kid. And... um I just, just, I just, I find that like a little, uh. You know, I, you know, I want to, I want to <laughs> add to this. You, you got me thinking. Uh, uh, so when I make art, there's a timelessness to it. And I think you just got me wondering or elevated my curiosity about my own process. So, you know, I, I channel the old master sensibility, like I'll paint old master paintings and then I'll refresh them, so to speak. Right. You add your own and, touch. Or and so that a contemporary audience can find a newer relationship with this old masterpiece. And, it, it, you know, the reason why I think I go back in time and then bring it back to where we are today is because there is an element of time there that is negated. And that in and of itself makes every moment a kind of a lifetime. So I don't, I don't really plan for the future. I don't, I mean, financially, yes, but I think. Right, 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 right. Because we know we should all be aware of, you know, our paths in terms of, uh, you know, down the road, we have to, you know, when you want to be secure and sound, but yeah, you know, I don't really, this, this conversation is, is worthy of a, you know, a big dinner and a lot of drinks and this could take, <laughs> hours and hours and days on end but i, I think told everyone, you we could talk forever <laughs> everyone has these conversations in their heads like like what constitutes time and i think i think as an artist i love the idea or the notion of timelessness and paintings you know they can be timely per, you know, so to speak they can they can be about the times in which we live which i think i focus on but they also could harken back to a period of like even the days of the where the Denise of Inns or Neanderthals were making cave art. Wow. It's all fascinating, really. So, yeah, yeah, I don't see myself anywhere in five years. I see myself somewhere in five minutes. Right. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. So a timeless piece, you know, it, it, it can be so relatable. You have an image of um, flowers in a vase with this blue and white vase that I've seen since I was born in relatives household right and then now you go to the store and you see a replica obviously different quality uh, but of a blue and white vase and like that to me is like a timeless piece so as i was zooming into your um artwork you know i see the shadows 
it looks like there's a portrait and there's a, um, a portrait um like a polaroid and then you see the shadow behind it you see the flowers falling to a certain direction and it's just like okay that's where the sunlight would be you know it's just like little things that i catch on within your art i i think you mentioned that you've been detailed since you were a young a young kid in the woods right With yeah yeah details yeah details <laughs> really matter to me i know that uh there's a lot one could say about details and uh but for me as a kid i always wanted to draw things that other kids could look at and say wow i know exactly what that is or hey that looks exactly like so and so or such and such so you made a comment about how you looked at a vase in one of my paintings a blue and white vase or vase and you had said that you had seen that as a child and then you had also seen it replicated in a store and whatnot. So when I painted, when I paint flowers, I do, you know, channel the old masters and not just going way back, but like to the days of Manet, who I think is one of the greatest painters that ever lived. And he did a whole series of flowers before he died. And I always put an element of my childhood in my paintings. This is a kind of, this is a secret oh, that, I'm well. telling, that I'm telling you, right, that I'm sharing right now. It's There's not an, a secret no more. No, <laughs> thank so you. So if you look at those paintings, of, so so some in some paintings of the flowers, say you might see the vase on a doily. That doily belonged to one of my grandparents, either my bubby on my dad's side, my nana on my mom's side. Wow, it's funny you brought that up because I always think about my childhood when I'm uh, painting. Not only did I see that as a child, I see it in pictures from years ago, generations, you know, where I didn't exist. So that that caught my attention. And today, you know, I see replicas in the store and I just want to buy them. I love them. So yeah, I do something. If I so I go to a lot of uh, flea markets and swap meets, as some people refer I love to them. Flea markets. If I find something that was that I had in in my childhood whether it was in someone else's house but i remember it or i owned it i would buy it just to have it so i have a lot of i don't know tchotchkes i have things trinkets i have things that always harken back my childhood how right. do you I, mean, I had a great childhood so that's sadly, awesome. some, some people may not but i you know we're all yeah. different i love that and thank you for sharing that secret with me um well now it's out so <laughs> so that is definitely um, a fun fact. I really love that. I really, really do. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your project, Project Holocaust. Yeah. It's very interesting. I, I heard what was going on. Art supplies were being snuck around and, and it was just very incredible. So I, I just want to go into that. Like, how did you get into really putting the spotlight on what was going on art wise during the Holocaust? Well, first of all, you did your research, that's for sure. So, um, so I'm a Jew, and I learned about 15 years ago that I had uh, 24 to 27 cousins who were part of the Hungarian deportations in 1944. We're talking, cut, and they were all murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau. But we're talking, you know, cousins, of course, naturally, that even my grandparents didn't meet. They were on my mother's side and her mother, my mother's maiden name is Solomon. Her mother's maiden name is Klein. It was the Klein family. So these are fourth and fifth cousins of mine. So I learned that they were murdered in the Holocaust. And I thought, wow, you know, this is very personal to me. And then I learned that there were seven other cousins who died freezing to death in the woods as partisan fighters against the Nazis in the eastern forests of Poland. So. Wow. There's very there's a lot of layers, and this got me doing some research. And as I was researching uh, the Holocaust, I focused on the concentration camp system. And there were thousands of concentration camps. I mean, I don't think many people really know. I don't want to get into this because this is like this is a longer conversation than talking about how life is about how not knowing where you want to be in five years. But <laughs> I'll just, I'll just be brief with this. And as as a college professor where I taught at Elmira College, upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region, I had asked the president and the dean of the school if I could create a course about the 
concentration camp system, but not just a focus on the system, a focus on a very specific focus, in fact, a rare focus on the artists inside the camps who learn to smuggle in supplies to make art about the horrors of the Holocaust. And that's what my focus is on. That's what my project is on. And I'm working on several small uh, documentary type films uh, about this topic, which in a very few words is really about the clandestine art that was made inside concentration camps by prisoners. Wow. Yeah. So you could go, I mean, pe people can go to my website and they can click on that, the, the, the Star of David, the yellow Star of David, which the Nazis forced the Jews to wear uh, in, you know, in their various languages. And they, it could take people to the link on, on the project a little more in depth. Wow. But thank you for asking. It means a lot to me. It's just as important as my art. I, I found it very interesting. But, but that um, takes people. Yeah. So this is a whole nother part of my life that I do. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, We're going to have yeah. to do like a documentary style interview with you, I think. <laughs> um, I'm so serious. I, I had this vision. It's so crazy. Art in itself has a message. And, you know, I can't even imagine. I did see some images that uh, from your website and I and I just. Wow, it's an experience and trying to figure out how they were feeling or what the message was, you know, it's really intense. But I do admire that you had the courage to ask the dean and, you know, the director and yeah, it, for this. That's pretty amazing. That's an accomplishment. There you go. <laughs> You. There's always a, a little hint of my childhood within anything I do. So um, I also admire my childhood. And um, because of, I am still the same person, just adult, right? Yeah, I hear you. I think we are <laughs> who we are as young kids. And then we learn to hone our skills, figure out our objectives, fall in love, fall out of love, find our weaknesses, learn to find strengths. I, I mean, you know, life is a really... There were so many cliches. And by the way, I, I'm totally all about cliches. I, they, they exist for a reason. You know, we respond to things in, in, in a metaphorical sense. And life is very much like a flowing body of water. And, you know, you, you can make the best decisions you can with the time you've got. Right. You can be best. You can be. I, I mean, the more informed we are about whatever it is, we want to be informed. We can make a better decision. We can be more effective. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever we, whatever, whatever we need to be, <laughs> we should always wake up and think, how can I be better? Right, right. You know, it's, when when you have a mindset, you know, a lifestyle that you do question yourself, like, how can I be better? How can I do things better? Or whatever, whatever you put yourself into, how can you do it better? Right. Right. Um, congratulations on being featured on the most influential art magazine. That's awesome Thank you. as Thanks. well. Um, I'm pretty sure you were selected for a reason and, and you are actually the cover artist. Um, I hope I didn't spoil that for you. I think you do that. <laughs> any gems or anything that you would like to share? Any additional fun facts? Still do you know what people ask me a lot? A lot. Because especially when I was a college professor, I... I was amazed how many of the students, you know, they all pretty much had headphones and I allowed it a lot of the time, but everybody listens to music, you know, like music is, I mean, I, there's no words uh, to say how powerful music I love is. You. You and people to ask me a lot, what do I listen to? People ask me <laughs> all the time, what, what do I, you know, I cut my hair a little shorter. I had it longer. People thought I was like a, a head banger, but so, I'm going to answer that question, even though you didn't ask it, because you said that you asked me what I wanted to share. No, you can share anything you want. I uh, listen to a lot of different types of music. Like I, could, I said well, that, but I don't think you heard me. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't. I didn't hear you. Say, what, what did you say? I said you probably listen to everything. Yeah, I listen. Well, not everything, but yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, there are some things I don't really like. You know, I have a lot of respect for for a lot of music, but to get me into the right groove or to get me in that right mindset, my God, the music has to be, uh, you know, it can be either wicked distracting, which is a real big issue because if I'm on my studio 
and I have on like the Ramones, who I love, I can't paint. Nothing. It's just they're just not painting music. Are you a dancer? <laughs> but well, no, I have great respect for people who dance. I mean, like, what do you mean? Like, like I don't. You mean like, like you ballet? Dance around, not professionally. Just like. Oh no! I jump, man. I move. I, I, I'm like, I can't believe I'm standing still this long to interview. Like, I'm, you know, I'm like, I want to move all over the place. But, <laughs> but, um, I, I'm very easily excited, and the Ramones get me wicked excited. Like the Ramones or Metallica, I can't listen to this when I'm painting, but I love, love heavy metal and punk and the Ramones. But when I'm working in the studio, I will tell you, this is like. I listen to a lot of symphonic or classical music. Okay, I was gonna say that. I, I you know, uh, yeah, I love listening I love Metallica, to Metallica. By the way, I yeah, love yeah, Meta yeah. So, I love probably the best painting music is either the Talking Heads or Bob Dylan or Neil Young. Believe it or not, it's wow, just diversity. That is that is a very uh, diverse mm -hmm. year there. <laughs> yeah, so it's Beethoven, Bach. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, and Talking Heads. That is so cool. That is super, super cool. So yeah, my playlist is just so crazy. So uh, when I'm painting, I can't dance a lot. I can't move around. But I do sing a lot. And I will put on the old crooners from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Bobby Darin, Dean Martin, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra. your entire playlist. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and man, do I sing. I could sing all day long to this music. Wow. Could it yeah, have so, been a career? I'm glad. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it's really important, you know, to to know what moves you. But I'm always up for two. I'm always up for uh, surprises. I mean, if, if you don't embrace the element of surprise, you're pretty much not understanding life. What are some of your hobbies aside from art? Because there could be art that is, you know, your 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 work, you know, as a professional. And then, then you have art that you maybe do just just for fun, right? But what are some hobbies that, um, aside from art that you have? Uh, I love to cook. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I, I, I like that answer, but you do well, love cook, to cook. <laughs> cooking is, um, you know, about exploring and experimenting. I mean, I, I cook the same way I kind of look at the way I'm planning a painting. I don't wind up with a painting but I do wind up with a meal that comes from different ideas. I love to uh, cross culture or. Nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Or, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I used to cook and I used to cook and eat bugs. So I have a whole nother project about that as well, which you may have escaped on my website, but yeah, I had a, yeah, I had one episode. Oh, I, I did see a few other things on your website. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I have any hobbies other than that. I mean, I'll try <laughs> anything, but I do a lot of things. I don't know if they're hobbies, but right, cooking, right. I do love taking my time to cook. I do love, you know, going to farmer's markets and buying the right produce and whatnot and, you know, having fun in the kitchen. That's wow. why I'm standing, I'm in my kitchen now. I just noticed, oh. there's a frying, noticed a frying pan above my head. It doesn't look like a frying pan, actually. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Thank you so much for your time and hanging out with me. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks. I would love to do, uh, you're welcome. I would love to do a follow up. I want to keep each other accountable. I, I just want to be part of the madness. <laughs> All right. Keep in touch. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll come back with you. <laughs>